My name is Michael Hoffman. I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse by clergy. I am 56 years old. My wife and I have been married for 27 years and we have two beautiful adult children. I remain an active Catholic despite the abuse that I endured when I was a little boy. My wife Kathy and I are parishioners of St. Mary of the Woods Parish in Chicago. We raise our children Catholic and we have sent our children to Catholic schools. Given the sexual abuse imposed upon me from the ages of 12 through 16 years old by our Catholic priests at the time, you may not understand my decisions. Typically, it is easier for many people to relate when a clergy abuse survivor walks away from the church. However, my efforts to find healing and hope from underneath devastating pain and sadness involves many people. And it is intertwined with the same church who allowed my abuser to remain in ministry at the time. The first time I attended the annual Mass of Hope and Healing was September 15th, 2012. My parents sat next to me and my wife and children sat in the pew behind us. Francis Cardinal George celebrated this liturgy. The two scripture readings were about the despair and isolation felt by a person in exile from the Book of Lamentations and also the comfort of God's mercy which can be found in the Beatitudes. Their, ju their juxtaposition shows the balance that we all need, the Cardinal said in his homily. He spoke about the need for both balance and integrity in every human life. He went on to say, victims of clerical sexual abuse, often years or decades after the abuse occurred, often talk as though they put that experience in a box and closed it off from the rest of their lives. But they must open that box to live fully integrated lives and to stop the abuse from causing further damage, he went on to say. To be honest, I'll never forget sitting there, listening to the Cardinal preach, thinking to myself that he was really putting himself out there and taking a risk, especially as he referred to his brother priests. I was really pleased. It made me happy to know that our church leader was saying such right and appropriate comments, even though it may have been personally difficult to do that for a man in his position. I thought to myself then, boy, if he can put himself out there and take a risk by speaking about healing from abuse, then maybe, just maybe, I can do the same. Hello and welcome to this ninth annual Pinwheel Prayer Service for Child Abuse Prevention. Every year we come together in prayer to acknowledge the dignity, love, and safety that all children deserve as children of God. The past eight years, we've gathered at the Healing Garden of the Archdiocese of Chicago. Now that is a sacred space dedicated to the healing, recovery, and reconciliation of all child abuse victims and their families. And we forget those who harm us, those who harm us. Spiritual healing is reconciling the truth of the abuse along with my family history, my, my Catholic heritage that my parents instilled in me and blessed me with, along with that uh, attempt to re restore my faith. There is a risk in gathering in this way that the wounds of abuse may reopen. And yet we must come together as a church to remember the bad things that have happened. This is the only way we can heal, learn, and grow to be better 
to be a better church by providing a safe environment for our children and to be better individuals within the church to ensure that our children are kept safe and secure. Many priests are anxious about this whole issue of uh, abuse of children by clergy. And so they freeze. They don't know what to do. They might be anxious themselves. I'm, I'm only acknowledging that because I'd like, I'd like to, uh, on a human level, have the priest acknowledge that there might be, they might feel anxious talking with a clergy sexual abuse survivor. They might feel that way, and I understand that. But I'm asking them to identify that and put that on the shelf for a moment. If anyone ever tries to hurt you or do anything that doesn't feel right to you, I want to reassure you that it's okay to tell a trusted adult. Also, if any adult asks you to keep a secret about what they did to you, that's wrong. That's very wrong. And I want you to know that there are trusted adults who will believe you and who want to help you and who want to keep you safe. This includes, but it's not limited to, your parents, they will believe you. The teachers, the principals, the priests at your school and the parish, they will believe you. And of course, you should always tell the police. They will believe you and protect you. My abuser, he took so much from me, but I will not ever allow him to take away my faith. With the work of so many people, wonderful people, my family, my friends, and so many priests who have walked with me on my healing journey, I have been able to reclaim what was lost to the truth of the abuse. Now, it is my hope and prayer other abuse survivors of childhood sexual abuse across the world may flourish and heal, and hopefully with God's grace, they may regain the joy, laughter, and the innocence of a little child. They've been rescued from Islamic State clutches after suffering horrific abuse. Now, American lawyer Jacqueline Isaac has launched a campaign to get asylum for 100 Yazidi girls who were kidnapped by IS extremists in Syria. Interview Ikhlas. Ani ismi Ikhlas Khadr min fatat Iraqiya min al Diyan al Azadiya. أحد الضحايا الداعش اللي بسنة 2014 بشهر الثامن وقد لي داعش دخلوا على السنجار وقبضوا على مناطقنا. Northern Iraq report that fighters of the Islamic militant group ISIS have carried out a massacre. أبوي قتل أمام عيني وخطفوني ويا كل عائلتي فرقوني من أمي. وسبعة شهور ما شفت أمي وتعرضت وتعرضت على أبشع الجرائم الاختصاب والدرب والتعذيب كل يوم والبيع العلاج الروحي هي أهم خطوة للمفروض الإنسان يسويها بحياته لأن علاج الروح هي مهمة للآخرين لأن إحنا مو بس تعرضنا على اختصاب الجسد وتعذيب الجسد إحنا حتى روحنا تعب من العذاب والجرائم اللي إحنا شفنا بحياتنا الرجال الدين هو يمثل شعبه ويمثل قومه وبغض النظر أي ديانة كانت المفروض يكونوا مع الحق ويوقفوا مع الظلم ويحجوا الحقيقة وما يخافوا من أي شيء لأن إحنا نشوفهم قدوة إلنا ويوقفوا مع الناجيات والناجين ويخبرهم ويحد ويقولهم واللي صار وياهم كان اختصاب وكان بدون ردائهم مثل ما سوى الأب الروحاني للإيزدين اللي هو قد وقلنا لجميعنا أنا صايرة وياي أكثر من 
اكثر من شيء اللي مستحيل انساهم بحياتي اللي ساندوني واللي وقفوا وياي ولكن احب اخبركم بثلاث اشياء اول شيء هي اول ما تحررت والاستقبال للايزيدين بصوره عامه وكل شعب العراق اللي استقبلونا يا هي كانت اجمل استقبال واني بحياتي ما راح انساها واللي حد اللي من اول اللحظه ولحد الان اللي هم شبابنا وبناتنا اللي اللي ديساندونا بشغلنا وبعملنا وبكل خطوه اللي دنسويها والشغله الثانيه بسنه 2014 بدايه تحريري تعرفت على محاميه اسمها جاكلين فت عليها صدفه ولا هي ولا اني ما كنا نعرف انه هي اللي راح تكون علاج لهمي وعلاج لوجعي وقت لي مسكت بايدي وقالت لي احنا ويا بعض رح نوصل صوت المظلومين ونوصل للعداله ونوقف ويا الحق اني بيومها ما كنت اقدر اصدق هذا الشيء اللي صار وياي لان كانت صدفه وهديه من رب العالمين وما كنت اقدر استوعب ولكن مع الوقت عرفت انه هاي الانسانه اللي صارت دواء لجرحي والهي اللي حطت ايدها على الجرح وخلتني اشفى واتنفس من جديد والشغلة الثالثة اللي هي آه وقت اللي رحت على بريطانيا على امريكا على اي مؤتمر كان التعاطف اللي كانوا يتعاطفوا وياي والخطوات اللي هم كانوا يسووها ويقدموا ويانا والاشياء اللي هم قدموا لنا اني همنا ما اريد اخبرهم ان ما يستسلموا لاي درف كان لان هم بيوم من الايام كانوا اسعب طرف بحياتهم وبقوتهم وبشجاعتهم قدروا انه يخلصوا حالهم من هذاك العذاب ولذلك اني فخوره بكل وحده منهم واشوف كل وحده منهم امل لشعب كامل ولكل العالم واني فخوره بهم جميعا واحبهم to Brisa de Angulo, who is the founder and co-president, together with her husband, Parker Palmer, who's right up there, of the um, Breeze of Hope Foundation, which is the first center in Bolivia to provide free comprehensive services to child and adolescent victims of sexual violence. So thank you for joining us today, Brisa. Um, can we start with your own story? Tell us a little bit about how you became involved in this work. My name is Brisa de Angulo, and I'm the CEO and founder of A Breeze of Hope. It is the first organization in Bolivia that provides free legal, social, psychological services to children who've been sexually abused. And all of it started with my own story. When I was a child, I was repeatedly raped and tortured by a family member, an adult family member, who also happened to be a youth pastor. One of the hardest things for me when I started disclosing my abuse was when people come to me and tell me that everything happens for a reason or that this is what God meant. Um, because for me, the understanding of God is that God is a person or is a, a being, a, a sense of love and perfection there is no way in my mind that God intended this to happen to me. And because of that, I think that I've hold my faith to be what has taken me to the place where I am. And even though I, my life was a complete mess and I developed bulimia and I developed anorexia and I tried to commit suicide twice, I found the strength to keep on going because my core was centered in God and what that means to me. So one thing that's important to understand is that religious institutions do not create sexual aggressors, but sexual aggressors gravitate to religious institutions because they are a safe space. And we need to make this a safe space for survivors. 
not for aggressors. How do we do that? By talking about it, by realizing that this is our reality. We live in a society where 30% of women are sexually abused and 20% of boys are sexually abused. When we can speak about this, when we can take action about this, we create it safe for survivors and for those who haven't been sexually abused. If we don't talk about it, we're making it safe for aggressors to hide and to go and use children and continue sexually abusing them. And when we don't talk about it, we are putting the shame and the silence on the victim. So what church members can do and what religious members um, and leaders can do is break the silence, talk about it, have support groups, let people know that this is a place where we can come to heal, where we can come to bring our wounds and we will be listened and we will be believed. When I meet other religious people and say, you know, this was part of God's plan. Um, and I honestly respond that I don't know what God you believe in, but it's not the God I believe in. God did not create me so that I could be raped. Nor do I believe that God creates a person that later becomes a rapist. And that it is a choice if someone starts sexually abusing someone. From the perspective of the victim, God did not create a person that, that, so that person can then be sexually abused. Um, but God can use what was meant to harm you, to transform it and use it for something to to be good. Um, and then that's a choice too, like going to God and say, hey God, I give you my brokenness, I give you my pain, and I want you to use it so that we, we can do something with this together. So God can use what was meant to harm you to create something good. At age 17, I had the dream of creating a space where victims of sexual violence could find what I never found which was someone who says, I believe in you and you're not alone. And so I started going to universities and telling my story, story and inviting them to come and walk with me against sexual violence. I went on TV, I went on the radio, I started talking to people, inviting them to come to the march and to wear a blue ribbon to show that they were against sexual violence. And it was beautiful. Now it's a whole program where thousands of girls are receiving therapy and justice and dreams for the future. From the perspective of those who haven't been sexually abused and who are not aggressors, there's something that I really want you to understand. That you are either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. There is no middle ground. If you choose to be silent, you are being part of the problem. If you choose to break the silence and you choose to talk about this, then you're being part of the solution.